On the Saturday evening of July 23, 2016, 23-year-old dental student Kaylee Sawyer attended a bachelorette party in the small city of Bend, Central Oregon. She was seen dancing at the Mavericks bar with her two friends at roughly 10.45 p.m. This and was really reportedly sad. highly intoxicated. At Before we get started, I will be issuing a trigger warning. Uh, this one is really, really sad. Uh, I know the details already. Some of you also know the details as well. We're like re-watching just the JCS take on it. So I'm just letting you know. A trigger warning is being issued, okay? Uh, trigger warning. No, it's not the Casey Anthony one. This is kidnapping. I'm out. What? Okay. This one has, uh, this one has, like, uh, mentions of rape, stuff like that. <laughs> Alright, well, if you can't handle it, then yes, bye. Bye bye I've actually never heard someone be like, oh, I can't watch this, I'm leaving. That's interesting, I was just shocked by it. But literally, that's what trigger warnings are for, right? All right, let's do it. At the time, an hour and a half later, at 12.04 a.m., she called her long-term boyfriend Cameron to come pick her up. He said he would, and arrived just six minutes later. During the short drive back to their shared apartment, they got into an argument after Kaylee admitted to talking with another guy at the bar. Cameron got annoyed and accused her of flirting with someone else, at which point Kaylee got extremely aggravated and asserted he had done something similar the week before, and that she hadn't attacked him for it. When they arrived at their Alpine Meadows apartment complex, Kaylee was in tears. Her boyfriend told her to take a minute to cool off, and went up to their second-story apartment at exactly 12.14 a.m. Kaylee was left in the car with the keys, but by 12.24, she still hadn't come up. Cameron went back down thinking she had passed out, but when he got to his car, it was empty, with the passenger side door left open and the keys left on the driver's seat. Cameron tried calling, but her phone rang out, so he sent her a text asking where she was and got a reply within three minutes. She told him she was sorry she wasn't good enough for him, and then said goodbye. Assuming she was walking to her friend's house roughly four miles away, he got back in his car and drove up and down College Way trying to find her, only because he wanted to drive her to her friends so she wouldn't have to walk in Why is it that literally everyone just glances over what I'm saying? Yes, we watched this case on a different channel. We never watched the JCS coverage of it. Yes, we watched this case. We are familiar with the case. That's why... Oh my god, literally while I'm in the process of describing it, there's still people saying, haven't we watched this one before? Not this one, not the specific one. We watched, we know about the case. We've already seen the case. In the middle of the night, he couldn't find her and wasn't aware of her friend's exact address, so he assumed she had arrived at her destination. Cameron then went to sleep, thinking that the best time to talk would be when Kaylee was sober in the morning, but when he tried calling her again at 9 a.m., it went straight to voicemail. Kaylee's phone remained off throughout the day, and her presence on social media abruptly ceased. Her friends and family grew increasingly concerned, and a missing persons report was filed at exactly 7.31 p.m. to the Redmond Police Department. As Kaylee's boyfriend, and being the person she lived with, Cameron was the first to be questioned. He was the last person to see her, and and admitted they had gotten into a heated argument on the night she went missing. In most circumstances, this would make someone the prime suspect and the central focus of an investigation, yet the Redmond police would later testify that they were confident he was innocent. He was forthright with us the entire time. He allowed us to look at his computer, allowed us to look at his phone, allowed us to look in the car, allowed us to go through the apartment. He was so cooperative from the get-go. We've had suspects, boyfriends, husbands, spouses, that have done these similar things that also act obviously cooperative to try to steer us off them. So we weren't ignoring him, but it's hard to put into words. You do this long enough and sometimes you can just tell when almost like the fear or the sadness isn't genuine, you know? 
And you could, and here you could see, like, he truly had no idea where she was. Investigators then switched their focus. They wanted to find the identity of the man Kaylee was... A man basically just said, I vibe-checked him, okay? Like, I just, I vibe-checked him, and he fucking succeeded, okay? Vibe-check did not fail on that one. Straight up. <laughs> talking to in the bar the night before. So the next step was to check surveillance and interview each of Kaylee's friends that were out with her that night. However, none of this was carried out as the very next morning the first lead would emerge. Police officer Isabel Ponce Lara arrived at the Redmond Police Department stating she had information about the missing girl and that it involved her own husband. Like, I, I... The crazy thing about this one is that like, she's a cop and he's like a wannabe cop. Thank you, a woman, that's what he said. I'm like, what do you mean? Then he's like, I hit her with the car. And what did you say to that? So I'm like, what do you mean? What, what, what do you mean you hit her? And he's like, yeah, I hit her and I panic. So then I asked him, like, that's what I was trying for him to explain to me. So you hit her with the car. That's an accident. Yeah. Why? What do you mean you panic? What, what do you mean? And what did he say? He just kept saying, I panic, and at that point, he's already, like, he got up, and he's already, like, going into the room, and... Chatters, I'm gonna ask, uh... I'm gonna ask you guys to fucking yell at the other chatters who come in to just be like, we watched this, we watched this, okay? You can just... I I'm gonna let you guys... I'm gonna let this community self-police here, okay? Self-police. Walking back and forth. And I'm not really quite understanding what he's telling me. And then he just kept saying, I need to go, I need to go. And then right before he left. Does this have like, TOS in it? There's her stuff in the shed. It wasn't making any sense to me. But when I saw the stuff, I'm like, oh, fuck. Her husband was 31-year-old Edwin Lara, a campus security guard at Central Oregon Community College. He drove a work-issued public safety vehicle, which much like a police car, had a partition divider that separated the front and back seats, and the back doors were unable to be opened from the inside. It was just 30 hours after the missing persons investigation was launched, and police now had their prime suspect. All they knew was that he told his wife he had accidentally killed the victim, stole her firearm before fleeing, and was now unreachable, with his whereabouts unknown. The Redmond police then checked the shed that was mentioned in his wife's statement and made a gruesome discovery. Inside a trash bag was Kaylee's purse, clumps of blonde hair, and a large rock that was covered in blood. The evidence disputed the fact that Kaylee had been hit with a car. Police came to the assumption that the rock was most likely a murder weapon, and the clumps of blonde hair had been ripped out of Kaylee's head as she was subdued, and most likely raped. The Redmond police then switched Kaylee's case from a missing person to a homicide, and her family were made aware that in all likelihood, their daughter was no longer alive. That same evening, at exactly 8.45 p.m., 19-year-old Andrea May walked out to her car after working a double shift at a clothing store in Salem, nut. two hours north of where Kaylee went missing. She took a quick selfie on Snapchat and was scrolling through her Facebook news feed when all of a sudden a stranger, armed with a gun and wearing a bulletproof vest, opened the passenger side door and got in. He pointed the weapon at her and told her to start driving. Out of fear of her life, she obeyed. He then told her to drive to California, which was a 10-hour journey, but made her pull over after just one hour so they could switch seats and he took over the driving. After almost three hours, he stopped at a roadside motel in Southern Oregon. He told Andrea to pretend to be his girlfriend, and that if she alerted any suspicion or even made eye contact, he would immediately kill both her and the clerk. The moment he got the keys was captured on surveillance. The clerk would later testify that he knew something was off, as the girl had clearly been crying due to makeup running down her face, and also seemed nervous and fidgety the entire time.
Once inside the motel room, Edwin handcuffed Andrea to the bed and demanded that she took sleeping pills. She initially refused, at which point Edwin pulled out a syringe and said she could either take them willingly or forcefully. She then swallowed three tablets of unknown strength, but was smart enough to warn him that she had an STD and passed out soon after. They left the motel early the next morning before daylight and continued on to Northern California. By the time they got to Wairika, Edwin noticed the car was leaking oil, so he pulled over at another motel for the purpose of stealing a new vehicle. Andrea pleaded with him to leave her behind, but Edwin told her she had to come with him and that if she ran, he wouldn't hesitate to shoot her in the back. They walked up to a middle-aged man unloading his car. Edwin pulled out the gun and demanded the keys, but the man refused and yelled out for help instead, at which point he was shot in the stomach. Edwin then grabbed Andrea's arm and ran from the motel toward the gas station next door. They got to a car carrying a family of three people, including an elderly woman. Edwin forced Andrea to get in the back seat as he got in the passenger seat, then held the driver at gunpoint as he made him drive away from the scene. He let the family out 15 minutes later, but forced Andrea into the front seat, despite her continuous pleas to let her go. Moments later, he recorded a video on her phone, detailing who he was and what he had done. He then made her post it to her Facebook page and title it Murderer on the Loose. Edwin then called his wife and his family, all of whom told him to turn himself in. He then called 911 at exactly 6.52 a.m. 911 emergency reporting. Yes, hi. This is Edwin Lara, and I'm the guy on Interstate 5. You know, I, I am wanted for murder in the state of Oregon. Okay. Edwin, yeah. where are you at right now? Can you stop? I am going to stop once I head Reading. Once I'm in Reading, I'm going to stop. Okay, can you tell me where you are right now? I have no idea. Are you by yourself? or? No, I have someone with me. I kidnapped her in Oregon. She's innocent. Okay. Uh, her name is Andrea. I'll let her give her last name. We can call her family, okay? Okay. Just give me a, se just give me a second. Hello? Yeah, hi. What's your name? Andrea. Are you hurt at all, Andrea? No. No? Okay. Let me talk to Edwin again. Okay. Hello? Yeah, Edwin, you're heading southbound on 5? Yeah, I'm heading southbound on 5. I'm passing a state trooper, a highway patrol right now. You're what, sir? I'm passing a highway patrol. Are you able yes. to safely find somewhere to stop? I'm not going to stop right here. I'm just going to turn myself in and, and uh, corning. Okay. Are you going uh, to corning police, or where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to corning police. But... I want to ask you a favor. Uh-huh. So I have asthma. You have asthma? Okay. Yeah, so you tell them not to be too rough on me because, you know, I, I can't really breathe right now. All right, so that's all I wanted to say. Do you, you know, need, I don't want to... Do you need any kind of medical or...? Yeah, well, I, I think so. I'm going to need my inhaler. I forgot my inhaler at home. You know, I went all over, all over uh, uh, Salem, Oregon, looking for for an inhaler, but I guess they don't sell it, you know, behind the counter or out of counter. Are, so... Uh, Edwin, how fast are you going? I'm going about 120 miles an you hour right now. about 120 miles an hour? Yes. Can you slow down? Well, I want to make it there quick. That way I can turn myself in. Well, well the officer sees you. We just don't want you to speed away from anything. If you can stop and just give yourself in, it'll probably be easier. Well, there's an officer behind me right now. Okay, they see you. We're talking to him. They see you. Yeah, she's seeing me. I think it's a she. She's right behind me. Okay, the officer sees you. And are you able to safely stop? Yeah, I, I can stop, uh, but not right now. I'll stop in Corning. Uh, what's the difference from stopping now in Corning? I just don't want to stop right here in the middle of the road, you know, putting myself in danger and putting everybody else in danger, more in danger, I guess. Edwin, do you have any weapons with you? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I do have a gun on me. I am not going to flash the gun, so you tell them not to shoot me. Okay. You know, I don't want to die. Okay, you stick by your words. I'll let them know. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm going to let them know. You know, uh, don't hurt Andrea. You know, she's a nice girl. I am I am wanted for the death of uh, Kaylee Sawyer at Bend, Oregon. Okay. And I am very remorseful for that. And you know. Okay. Edwin, her, can, Edwin are uh, you able to stop the officers behind you? They don't know if you're running and stuff. Okay. I'll slow down for them. Okay, you're gonna slow down. 
Yeah, I'm gonna slow down. Okay. You know, I don't, I don't want somebody else to get hurt. I did. So are you gonna stop? Yeah, maybe. I will stop right now. I'm used. You know, I'm shaking up. I mean, I'm shaking. I, I understand. I, know, I don't want to. I don't want to get shot. So, you know, I know this is being recorded, and you know, I just want to say to the family of, of Kaylee that you know, I am sorry. I am sorry for what I did to her, and in time, I will tell them where the body is. You know. Do you want to uh, let me know, or just have this recorded where it is? No, I, I remember. Okay. So, I mean, hopefully the police officer doesn't shoot me. Okay, I'll let you talk to Andrea. Okay, are you going to okay. stop? Yeah, I'm going to stop. Okay, that. once you stop, make sure they can see your okay. hands at all yep. time, okay? Don't hang up. I'm not. Hello? Yeah, hi, Andrea. Are hi. you okay? You don't need any medical or anything? No. Okay, Edwin, where's his gun at? Does he have it still between his legs? Um, I don't know. Can you see it? He said he had it between his legs. Is he stopping? Yeah. He is stopping? Mm-hmm. Okay, make sure your hands are up too and stuff. I know you're on the phone right now, but just hold your hand up so they can see your hands too. Okay. I'm going to stay on the line with you until the officers get there, okay? And you're going to be okay. <clears throat> Andrea? Just so fucking casually, like, hey, I need an inhaler. Yeah, I feel so bad, dude. Man, this fucking sucks, bro. Fucking sucks. That's why I like kidnapped another person, but like I just don't want to hurt anyone. It's like, dude, the fuck do you mean you don't want to hurt anyone, motherfucker? You're literally hurting everyone, dude. Insanity. Mm -hmm. Does Edwin have does he have his hands up? Yeah. He does have his hands up? Okay. He's like, I don't want to hurt anyone. Bro, you're driving 120 miles an hour down the fucking highway. Like, even that alone is, is very likely to hurt someone. Before we, you know, before we talk about how you kidnapped someone with a gun after you did a murder. <laughs> the worst demand he makes, the worst demand he makes is the fucking top of the hour ad breaks running right now. He's like on the phone and he's like, it's top of the fucking hour. That means there's a 60 second ad break on the hostile every broadcast. Okay. But at least he makes up for it by saying, you know, you can avoid those ads if you have an ad block or a VPN or by subscribing either with a $5 a month subscription or with an Amazon prime. Cause you get one free Twitch prime that you can use on your favorite best segue Andy streamer. He, so good. Them. Step over to your right. Step over to your right. Away from traffic. Drop down to your knees. It was just after 7 a.m. when Edwin Lara was arrested and taken into custody at the Redding Police Department in Northern California. He was brought into the interrogation room at 1 p.m. It was now exactly 60 hours after Kaylee had gone missing. Hello, sir. Hi. My name is Sergeant Beckwith. I'm Mac. Oi. I shouldn't introduce myself because he has no names. Uh, we know a little bit, right? <laughs> Uh, so a couple things. We have some housekeeping items to talk about okay. um, before we start talking about things. Those are going to be your Miranda rights and your right to counselor. Okay. And then I wanted to talk to you, um, you know, just to let you know where I'm coming from, because um, it sounds like you've done a lot of good things, um, even to this point. And so we're not really concerned about the NDA at this point. It's going to be about, you know, finding her. Okay. So, uh, but before we do that. Um, do you have any questions for me on the onset before I advise you of some things? Because uh, I'm going to advise you of your Miranda rights and your consular rights, okay. right, before we start talking about things at all. But as far as questions you have before we get into that, I'm a, all my cards on the table kind of guy, okay? I'm not going to come in here and try to be all tricky or whatever. 
uh, Detective McLaughlin's same way. Okay. Well, all I got to say is that I want to go home. Okay. I'm going to do everything possible to go home. Yes, sir. And home meaning Oregon? Yes. Okay. Of course. Home. Home, right? Yeah, we're working on that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's something we're working on. You want us to notify the consular's office at this time? No. Okay. All right, so here's the uh, thing I just want to get through the nitty gritty. Uh, we have not been able to find Kaylee's body. Can you please uh, help me find her body immediately before we start talking about anything else? Oh. Um. The reason why I'm asking you that is uh, I've done this a bunch of times. I want to tell you where the body is. Yeah. I do, but I want to get on it first. Okay, so here's what I know about this. Hear me out, sir. Uh, we can't change what happened, the three of us in this room. And people will care more about what happens right now than what happened before. So um, we know that you've been talking to some people, et cetera, et cetera, right? And because we have different jurisdictions, I can assure you that right now the DA's office is working on allowing us to take you back to Oregon, okay? But they're still working on that, okay? So in the meantime, uh, we need to consider some things, okay? If this information gets to other people that uh, you were like, hell yeah, I'm gonna tell you, but only until I get what I want, they might uh, try to think of this about something different than what it is. The suspect has stated his desire to be transferred back to Oregon where his family is and will only start talking once this is guaranteed. The detective's response is to induce fear. He starts attacking the suspect's character and alludes to the perceptions of others with regard to his character. This type of approach is typically used at the later stages of an interrogation as building rapport is most often the main focus this early on. The most common approach at this moment would be for the officer to lie and tell the suspect they will do everything in their power to fulfill the request. However, the most common approach is not always the most effective. Right. And so um, what I've determined is, and we've looked at this a bunch of times, is I don't think you're a bad guy. The detective now elevates the suspect's character by what's known as reframing. He presents a different way of looking at the situation, which puts the suspect in a more favorable light. This is the perfect approach to take at this moment, yet the detective marginally slips up. He appears to get slightly aggravated once the suspect breaks eye contact and reverts back to a mild display of aggression. Right? I think that things have spun completely out of control, sir. Sir, am I right? Okay. The detective seems to have a hard time in concealing his disgust and anger. It's a slip of the mask, but fortunately isn't too drastic at this early stage. But, that being said, you know from your training and your education that we have a massive load of resources right now dedicated to one thing, and that's to serve the victim's family, okay? And they need that, and they need that right now. And so, I need you to remember that it doesn't matter so much about what happened as what you do now. Yeah. And, and you know this I'll man, not a man okay. wants to do a map. So before, can I say the story what happened first? Yeah, as you're drawing, please, or whatever, whatever you'd like to do. Sir, <laughs> Wants to get you out of that stuff. I wave from um, yeah. It says you'll see it right away. Buried in the ditch. Yeah. Is it buried or it's not buried? It's just okay. in the ditch itself. It's just in the ditch. Okay, it's outside the highway, across from that mailbox. Correct. You're doing good, Edwin. You know what? This is not easy. I mean, you might be a little bit scared. We're going to hear what you have to say. We're, we really, really want to. I'm thankful, and so is Sergeant Beckwith, that you know what the right thing to do is right now and that's to help us locate her for her family for the community for us for you for your wife all that good stuff okay so um i'm, I'm thankful to you i want to say that right away that you hear what this man has to say and that you've got a heart inside of you and i know because i was in your house i saw the bible i know you thumb through it a lot i see that you've tithed for months consecutively um, I know you're, you, you have God in your heart, okay? And that's just not a trick. That's eternal, right? You know that. But I'm not talking about this moment. I'm talking about the big picture, okay? And so I appreciate your honesty. So what happened, man? What happened? 
the, like the straight up what happened. So I was putting the signs up where there was an event going on. Uh, it's it's called yeah. um, cyclist event or whatever. You know, I was in a hurry because I wanted to get out of here. And I was going to turn south on College Way on the D4 lot. So I was going to turn south on the do not enter area there. It's worth noting that investigators had already come up with their own detailed account of what most likely happened, which was that Edwin offered Kaylee a ride and that she trusted him because of his occupation and the vehicle he was driving. Once she got in, he drove to a secluded area, raped her, and then murdered her with the rock that was found in his shed. They will entertain his version of events to start with, but then push for further admission once they attain his baseline narrative. And I didn't see her, she was wearing all black. So I was in a hurry, so it was my fault. And I wasn't expecting anybody, you know, at that time of night. So I just turned and, and I, I mean, I didn't hit her that hard. I just bumped her with the, the patrol car, bumped mm -hmm. her with the front rack. And she fell down. And at first I thought, you know, first thing I was, oh, I killed her, you know, but I didn't hit her that hard. So I got off the car and she was really drunk. And then she looks at me, and then she started screaming. She started screaming at you. She did. So I panic and I just grab her by the throat and I told her, "Shut up! Shut up! Shut up!" So she passed out. I put her on the back of the patrol car. Drove her up the B12 lot and then I was panicking I didn't know what to do she already seen me she saw my face <clears throat> so I opened the door and that's when she came back she started screaming again so I grabbed the truck home and I was telling her shut up shut up shut up shut up she was just struggling to scream So I threw her down and my head over the rock on the head. After that, I drive her body <clears throat> behind a tree there and I hit her over another rock. And, and that's when I think she died because I heard her breathing. Her best breath. He goes on to state that he left her body in the deserted parking lot, goes home to wash his clothes, drives back with his personal car, wraps her body in a plastic sheet, and puts her in the trunk. So what happened next? So I drove her to a ditch by um, close to my parents' house and you know, she was kind of heavy, you know, so I just grabbed her and pretty much ripped everything off her, like her pillow, I threw her in the ditch. He goes home, but then returns soon after to move the body to a more secluded location. You know, and at this time I was feeling really bad, you know, because I never killed anybody in I feel really bad about her, about the girl. But she didn't deserve to die. And <clears throat> I was feeling really bad about what I went to. Cause she's my everything. And I know that most likely I will die in prison, you know. And that's going to be one of the things that I'm going to take in my heart. Is it And the regret of killing this girl. Nope. And I know this. Nope.
He regrets getting caught, bro. That's what he regrets. He reported projects to the parents. To the dad, I know the dad has been looking for other stuff, but projects. I wonder what he she thinks. Like, does he think this is gonna fucking get him like a lesser sentence or something? What I did. Um, I woke up with this thing in my heart, like heavy, you know. And I'm like, so I knew that from the moment I told my wife she was gonna turn me in, because I know her. And she loves, she loves her job and she loves what she's doing now. I knew she was gonna do it, no matter how much she loves me. So I told her with that purpose. I told her, I kill this girl. I'm gonna walk out of here. I'm gonna drive out of here. You do your thing. She's like, why are you putting me in that spot? I'm like, because I know you're gonna do the right thing. I know you're not gonna be my complex because you're not the type of woman. So she kept telling me, please don't leave. Just turn yourself in, turn yourself in. And I'm like, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. He recounts the events leading up to the morning he left the roadside motel with his abductee, Andrea. I mean, I knew sooner or later I was going to get caught. And you know, for a fact. You know, and you just trying to buy some time. I was. Are you pretending that you didn't watch this video with Chad already? Is That's never been my. I'm not pretending at all. It's a different video. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's ban this person. Uh, it's a, that's a, that's a, yep, there it is. Sick pre-watch. 14 month dipshit, dude. He said, bye. Like what, what happens? Like after, again, there's like a turning point in the brains of my subscribers. Like after 12 months, they're like, I'm so fucking desperate. I just want a crumb of attention. Like I've been here for 14 months been giving like my you know been doing this for 14 months and he's never ever like i don't even remember that chatter's name and i will not remember it dude just be like a more fucking productive person to the chat and i'll i'll recognize you okay sometimes so i can say bye to my family i guess did you talk to your family after this yeah how'd that go not so good my grandpa told me that i screwed up my life um, my mom and dad can believe it, or my stepdad, I should say. He's like my dad. Can believe it. Um, you know, they were. Mods, don't unban the 14 month Andy when they inevitably fucking get into your DMs. Like, oh my god, I'm just, I was just kidding. I really wanted it. Please, please, please. Don't unban them. Very concerned about me. A large middle segment of the footage was cut. For whatever reason, the district attorney refused to release it. But what we know is that the investigators managed to get Edwin to drastically change his story. He goes from stating that he accidentally ran the victim over to now intentionally picking her up. He claims to have thought she was a prostitute, tried to solicit her for sex, and then panicked once she refused and affirmed that she was in fact a student. He said that he initially tried to make sure that she wouldn't call the police before letting her go, and that she then started screaming once he wouldn't let her out of the car, at which point he panicked and thought he had no other choice but to kill her. He goes on to state that he first got into the back and choked her unconscious. He then took her to a secluded parking lot and then bludgeoned her to death with a rock. There was no mention of sexual assault. The fact that he thought she was a sex worker is highly implausible, as prostitution in the area was unheard of, whereas drunken students walking home was a common occurrence, and they would often get a ride from public safety officers if they were to pass one. The suspect would have known that a young woman staggering home was most likely a drunk student as opposed to a prostitute. The detectives know this, and now try to push for the next step of admission. They attempt to get him to admit that his immediate intention was to both rape and murder the victim as soon as he saw her walking alone on the road. 
So a couple things you need to understand, and we're finally getting to the real problem here, we really are, is you knew she was never getting out the car the moment you shut that door. Well, let me finish. You need to let me finish, right? Because I know this, okay? Because you said we were hookers. Like, that's such a fucking horrific thing where you're drunk and you think the fucking public campus safety officer is going to, you know, help you out. Like, that's so, it's so fucked up. It's as indecent and as fucked up as, like, the way Ted Bundy used to lure people by uh, behaving like he was handicapped and in need of help. Like, it's so insane. It's so psychotic, dude. She's like, no. Immediately, you go, give me your purse and your phone. Well, I knew she wasn't going to get out. She wasn't going to survive that encounter, was she? No. Because you can't rape her and let her live, can you? And she I can't make a phone call if I you have it. I wasn't going to rape her. Well, you can't let her live. Edwin, we're missing something here, man. Look, yeah, I know what you guys are thinking, and it makes perfect sense. It does. Because why, would you ask, you why would you ask for her purse? What was in your head that made you want her purse? Because, you know... Just in case she had a gun? She, had, she, she could defend herself? She was going to use her phone to call 911. Call for so, help. but That's listen to listen to this. According to your story, th this is where it does not make sense. If your intent isn't already there to do some kind of harm or some kind of evil to her, some friggin' evil that's there, bro, it's there. You just gotta face it down, man. You can't cower away from it. You face that damn thing down right now. His fucking sh frame is being shattered right now. Okay, that's like. My man's got real Kyle energy, which is understandable. That's like how a human being would react in this situation. Surprisingly, <clears throat> one of the most like human reactions I've ever seen in an inter interrogation against like one of these bloodthirsty freaks. If you know the only way, if you don't have intent in her head, your thought is I got to My man said you're a Weasley little liar, dude. Keep that phone away from her because she's going to call from help before anything bad's even happened. You've already made a decision. Am I right or am I wrong? Tell me. So I made the decision at that time to silence her, to kill her. I, Let's be real. When you say yeah. silence her, you mean kill her. Is that correct? Okay. Because when did you make that decision? When she started screaming. Because she has seen my face. But you already grabbed her phone. You already kept her away from making a call for help or contacting someone. So you're already preserving yourself. So I'm thinking it's before... When you ask for the purse, I think you already know in your head, I'm going to silence her. I'm going to kill her. That, why else would you ask? So when she gave me her, like she had her phone, because I knew her phone was back there. Like it, it just clicked on my head and I put her purse back there, her phone is in there. You know? <clears throat> so I told her, give me, give me the purse. So... She hands over the purse, and I'm like, your phone is not in here. And she, is, she goes, yes, it is. So I start digging in the purse with this hand, and I find phones. Trying to come across as remorseful after admitting to doing a rape and murder is so fucking wild. Like, what? Like, what is this guy thinking? How the fuck did he think he was going to get away with this? It's actually mind-boggling. The thing I'll say about JCS, we've watched this on a different channel, and that one was really good too. Um, that coverage was really good too, but the thing that's different about JCS is like how much JCS focuses on the fact that he was a campus security, like campus public safety officer, and how that also adds an additional layer to the power dynamic where the victim thought that they were, you know, in the presence of safety. I totally missed that part in the previous one. Maybe, maybe it was in there as well. But it's very good. There, so, and, you know, very relieved. But at this time, she's struggling with the door, and I'm, and I'm telling her, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. You know why you felt relieved when you found that phone? You know why? Tell she me why you felt relieved. She wasn't calling her up. And she was never going to get away because she had seen my face already. She was already seen her face. And you already knew what you were going to do. No. You were going to silence her. You already told us that. Well, yeah, but 
Why else would I, you grab her phone? Because from the moment that's when I knew that she wasn't a hooker, you know. And she's, she's gonna tell. She's gonna say something. She, if I let her out of the car, <clears throat> she's gonna go say, "Hey, you know, security guard raped me or something." <clears throat> Do you have dominion over a woman? No, JCS didn't say that. He said, please don't use the fake accounts that re-upload paywalled content. This is a JCS account. Dominion? Mm -hmm. Dominant. But is there anything about her life that means less than yours? No. Okay. But you told us earlier when you were trying to carjack people in Salem, you wanted a woman who was weaker. Weaker woman because I knew a guy was going to fight me and I didn't want to kill anybody. Right. So you have dominion. I don't know. What I, what, necessarily I guess what I'm getting at with, with that question is that for, at some point or another, something as minor as an offensive comment, are you a hooker? I, I mean, honestly, what we've approached there is... You know is I'm going to go back on that last fucking idiot who's been a six-month subscriber. He's just asking a question, dude. Like, why are you fucking banning them? Because that's not a question, okay? There you go. You fucking derailed it. Do you understand? You just derailed the stream in the successful way that that other person was trying to derail the stream. Nowhere does JCS, even in the original fucking tweet that they posted, say, don't watch my videos. They literally say, we love your reactions. We just don't want you to watch the, uh, the, the re-uploaded videos. So that person... Literally, is already coming at the story from a negative point of view regardless. Okay, are you happy? That's why I fucking permanently banned them. Also, if you don't like it, if you don't like it, and uh, this is your fucking take on it, then you can get fucked, actually. Okay? I'm not going to do ban appeals anytime soon now, 14 month subscribers. If you think I'm going to do ban appeals and that's why you're trying to get on them, I'm literally not going to do it on purpose now, okay? I was going to do it, but now I'm not going to do it because it's so, so obvious that like long time community members in here unironically think that they could just like get fucking, uh, you know, make content out of like ban appeals because I did it one fucking time. Does anyone else want some? Eight month subscriber chat suck his dick, please. Acting like a big bitch to people who subscribe. Lol, your chat is useless. It moves so fast as it is. What is happening? Is there like a Discord where everyone got together and decided, uh, I fucking hate uh, Hassan. Uh, it's just like, fuck Hassan. I'm sick and tired of his bullshit. Is that what's going on? Is that what's happening? Does anyone want some more, dude? Do you like this? Is this the content that you wanted? Is this the content that you subscribed for fucking 14 months, dude? Is that what you wanted? Just a, uh, just for a petty single fucking moment of, of, uh, having your fucking username show up on the screen. Is that why? The reason why I ban people is because I want to just like ban them to show other people that like, this is not a way to chat in the chat to try to derail the stream. And then we move on. If you're going to, if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that and you want me to derail the stream, yeah, I'll, I'll do it for you. Okay. It's very fucking selfish. You are being selfish to the 32,000 other people in here. You just want your fucking voice to be heard for a brief moment and derail the stream. Okay. That's why I do that. Anyway, the rest of you are fine. I don't know why, like, I don't know why so many long-term uh, subs are, are actually coming at it from the point of view of, like, uh, you know, 
you're being so fucking, you're power tripping. You're being so annoying. You're being so annoying, blah, blah, blah. All right, let's keep going. You possibly losing your job for offending some offending somebody. Okay, people are offended every day. People lose their job for offending people every day. That all of a sudden became more important than the life of a of a human being that you say because is equal. I think. Right? I think. This is a very bizarre set of questions, especially considering what the detectives are trying to achieve. They are attempting to get the suspect to confess to first-degree murder with special circumstances, along with rape in the first degree. By attacking his character like this, and alluding to his supposed warped view on women, he will be unlikely to give further admission. It's more likely to get his guard back up and make him focus on preserving what he has left of his reputation. The detectives should instead be downplaying the crimes. They should be reframing his motives as both understandable and uncontrollable, almost as if premeditated rape and murder could be committed by anyone on a bad day. She honestly thought that I was gonna do something. You were, man. And when that's the problem right now, you were. You absolutely at, at first, At first I wasn't. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Well, sir, let me back up. Let me back up. Let's just settle this right now. When you saw that girl and you picked her up, were your intentions to help her because you're a security guard on the campus and people look up to you, was your intent to find some way to help her? Or was your intent to find a way of her, either by paying for sex or taking sex? And when things went south, you knew you had to kill her because now the person she looks to for safety and security wants something from her that she doesn't want to give him. Once again, instead of downplaying the crimes, he lays out the scene in a blunt manner. He makes his disgust at the alleged conduct far too noticeable when he should be remaining indifferent Thank at you, minimum. Thank you, Colton. Some for investigators the 10 would gift even sub. be able to feign companionship and sympathy at this moment, which would significantly increase the likelihood of further admission. So I've never seen cops get, like, this agitated when uh, people are... When they're talking to, like, a murderer rapist. It is a unique one. For sure. Like, normally, normally cops are able to keep their composure for a multitude of reasons. Maybe because they uh, identify with the murderer. Uh, who knows? But this one, they're, like, they're wilding out. Rayway 1021, thank you for the tank if thank you if this does. Maybe they're mad you blew up and there's no other way to there's other here to enjoy your competent. Is that stalker entitlement for the boys? No. It's not. I think they just want fucking uh attention. Like they're just so starving and so desperate for it. That's why they write dumb shit in the chat. And when I ban one of their like friends that are in like their little Discord, they all the other ones immediately dive in and they're like, Why the fuck did you do that? They, it's just, it's silly as fuck. Thank you, weird panorama for the 10 gifted subs. Um. Oh. It is when because, oh, her, he is a Hispanic dude who killed a white college girl. That should be a reason. Help someone and call her on the radio. Did you call her on the radio? No. Because I thought she was over. And... When I realized she wasn't an upper, I felt discovered. Oh, crap. You know, now she's going to go tell the whole world that I was looking for sex. Oh, wow. How weird would that be for a dude to be looking for sex? See what I'm saying? I and mean, that's not that's not that bad. Dudes right? look for sex. Dudes look for sex. Well, yeah, but not a security guard that is supposed to protect. Well, I think you just said it, man. Another random dude walking on the street. So are we lucky in the fact that the first time you can't control your urge to have sex with a beautiful woman, that we catch you? The sound, 
the sound that you heard after the strike of the first rock. Thank you to BR02 BKV for the test. second is agonal breathing, and you know this. It's the sound of life leaving her body. It's the sound of the life God breathed into her, leaving her, and her life being no more, going away, being done. It's the sound of everyone loving her, mourning. It's the sound of her blood crying out from the friggin' earth. Right? You know this. You need to hear it, though. Okay? I respect you enough, Edwin, at this point, that I, I've asked you for detail, and now I'm going to give you my own. Okay? Those are the cold, hard facts. Does God still love you? Will he forgive you? Will he bring you back into his heart? Will he? This is actually quite a good strategy, as the suspect is highly religious, yet the focus should be kept on this element as opposed to the magnitude of the crime, which the detective for some reason continues to incorporate into the dialogue. I just want to show, the reason why I banned that fucking 12-month Andy is because of this, okay? Because the 12-month Andy is like defending this, uh, this shit, okay? I, I ripped this from the Discord. I don't even know if that was the fucking, if this was the dweeb I fucking banned. Like, you're a fucking idiot, dude. If you've been in here for 12 fucking months, and I banned someone like this, and you're like, Ugh! he was just asking a question, like, you're literally a fucking moron. And I didn't permaban that person who was being a fucking moron. I gave them a week off. So when you pile on top of that and literally turn around and go, oh my God, you're so, you're such a fucking power hungry, power tripping uh, uh, dictator. then yeah, if you've been here for fucking six months plus, then yes, of course I'm going to fucking clap your ass cheeks and permanently ban you. Okay. And you kind of deserve it. Dialogue. Questions you have to answer for yourself. But the truth of the matter is that her blood cries out, man. That her life is gone. It will never be replaced. The truth of the fact is this. What you mistook for a hooker was an absolute angel. Was the apple of her mom and dad's eye. Was the breath that they breathed. That they spent and cultivated all their life raising and growing. And she is gone forever. With your semen all over her. Although the detective's approach is somewhat miscalculated, this is a highly revealing moment, as there is no denial whatsoever from the suspect about his semen being on the victim. That's the truth, man. Okay? It's brutal. It's hard to say. It's hard to sit in here. But you got to face it before you can look your God in the eye and ask for that forgiveness and be able to receive it. The investigators get no further admission from this moment on. This enabled the suspect to eventually take a plea deal in order to avoid the death penalty in 2017. They needed a confession of either rape or attempted rape to remove any sort of leverage from his defense. His sentencing hearing commenced on January 22nd, 2018. This morning, 32-year-old Edwin Lara pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and the death of 23-year-old Kaylee Sawyer. This plea deal means he will avoid a possible death sentence. Amy Frazier is live in Bend, where she's been at that hearing. Amy? Well, Kaylee Sawyer's family and friends have packed a courtroom here today as they face her killer. There's been both tears and intense anger as they tell the judge how Kaylee's murder has impacted their lives. At about 9.30 this morning, 32-year-old Edwin Lara pleaded guilty to one count of aggravated murder. He went on a multi-state crime spree, kidnapping a woman in Salem and then driving to California where he's accused of shooting a man and then carjacking a family before being caught. This morning, Kaylee's grandfather told the court he has three wishes. Number one, to have our Kaylee back. This JC seems kind of weak as a guy confessed from even before being detained. I prefer when they absolutely beak the killers. I'm missing our man Jim. Jimbo is the goat. I love the term absolutely beak the killers, unless you meant absolutely break the killers. But I love that beaking a killer is like a... It's a new term now. Yo, 
This guy fucking absolutely beaked the killer. Just beaked him. Thank you, Shreyway, for the 10 subs. And thank you, Colton's twin, for the 10 subs as well. Get fucked. Get beaked. Still don't quite understand the relevance of Jim's inability to swim. Could you elaborate? I fucking wish I understood that, dude. These guys are impossible to get a hold of, okay? I've fucking tried. God knows I've tried, dude. They are... They are so hard to communicate with. I don't know how to fucking... I don't know. They're just virtually impossible to communicate with. Like, they're... They're hard. Back with us. Alive and well. I'm pursuing your life. Number two, I'd wish to have this piece of garbage the defendant sentenced to death for what he's done to Mike Haley. And number three... I wish the court system and the state of Oregon would just hand him over to me and allow me to administer the death sentence. Kaylee's mom also spoke today calling Laura a monster. More family and friends will speak later this afternoon. The judge is expected to sentence him later today or tomorrow. We just found out a little while ago that the judge has sentenced Edwin Laura to spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of release, without the possibility of parole. In July of 2016, Kaylee went for a late night walk. Laura, who was working as a security guard at Central Oregon Community College lured and trapped her in the back seat of his patrol car. Prosecutor. Oh my God, it's a real thing. Speaking to trash talk someone to their face and make them look like an idiot in front of other people. That's awesome. I love that. Peter say he took her purse and phone and drove her to a remote parking lot on campus. Prosecutors say he sexually assaulted her and Kaylee fought for her life. Lara then, we're told, used a large rock to kill her and then dumped her body off the highway near Redmond. Now, just before being sentenced today, Laura addressed Kaylee's family and the court. Oh, I remember this. Oh, no, he will deny. <laughs> Forget fuck you, I asshole. You please heal the hearts, all those broken hearts of this community. Fuck him, dude. All along, Kaylee's family has said they want her to be remembered for the joy and the love that she brought to life. They say justice is now He's served. Bagged. But it doesn't ease their pain. Again, Edwin Laura will spend the rest of his life in prison without, we're told, any chance of ever getting out. Reporting live in Deschutes County, Amy Frazier, Coin Six News.